The Teaching of the Nicolaitans, Which Jesus Hates, Part 1, for Radical Disciples During These Very Last Days. If you'd like to have this presentation, as well as the video recordings of all previous sessions, simply email us at Elijah003 at gmail.com. No. After returning home from serving as missionaries and pastors in Indonesia for nine years, my wife and I planted churches and served as pastors in New York City and in Houston for 11 years. So we have served as pastors for a total of 20 years. We therefore understand the pressures and the temptations faced by local pastors. First of all, review what's the job of the the job description of the fivefold ministry according to scripture well let's look at ephesians 4 verse 12 where we are told that the job of pastors apostles evangelists prophets and teachers is to equip god's people for works of service so that the body of christ may be built up until we all reach unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. Now, that is the job description of the fivefold ministry. But due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which has infiltrated the church, the fivefold ministry has clearly failed to do its job. We all, meaning all of God's people, have definitely not become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. That is clear. Now, who is primarily responsible for this failure? In today's church, Pastors are the ones who dominate the fivefold ministries. In most churches today, the spiritual maturity of the believers depends primarily on the teaching they receive from their pastor. They sit under their pastor once or twice a week. Therefore, when all of God's people have not become mature, and have not attained to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ, the blame can be laid mostly at the feet of us pastors. How has this come about? Well, it is due to the effect of Western culture on the church in the West which has spread to much of the church elsewhere in the world, outside of the West. And this, in turn, is due to the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. In the early church, before the teaching of the Nicolaitans took root, it was not pastors who laid the foundation of the church and led the church. No, but rather it was the apostles. Now, let's look at how the culture of the West has affected the church in the West, and as a result, around the world as well. The culture in the West teaches that bigger is better. Bigger, and thus richer, means we are successful. Due to the immense, immense influence of Hollywood around the world today, we, especially in the West, we dream of becoming a rich and famous celebrity. This very same culture has infected the Church of Jesus Christ in the West. The very same culture. So, most of us pastors, we would like our church to grow and keep growing, ostensibly for the glory of God. Well, how do we bring that about? How do we keep our church growing? Well, one way, among others, is to keep our sheep from wandering off to another church or 
being stolen by a nearby sheep stealing church. At least that way we won't shrink in size. It should be noted at the outset that there are different kinds of earthly benefits to be gained by us pastors if we pastor a large church. For example, acknowledgement and respect from other local pastors and from the body of Christ. Resulting, for example, in our being elected president of the local pastors association. Often that happens. The pastor of the biggest church in town becomes elected as the pastor of the pastors, uh, excuse me, elected the president of the local pastors association. And there will be self-esteem, there will be satisfaction, and of course, financial benefits to name a few. Most of us pastors, of course, do not see these benefits as the primary motivation to grow our church in size. No, we do not. Rather, we see them, if anything, as only, quote, fringe benefits, unquote, to the accomplishment of reaching many lost souls for Jesus Christ. Glory to God. Pastoring a large church can also be a reward for skillful leadership and years of hard work. We pastors, we also know that it is our responsibility to make disciples of God's people, according to Matthew 28, verse 19. This is what Jesus commanded us. Therefore, go and make disciples of all nations, verse 20, and teaching them to obey everything I have commanded you. Now, we all, therefore, are to be discipled, all of us. And we are all to be taught everything in order for us to become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. But, do we pastors really rejoice if many matured disciples in our congregation leave our church to serve the Lord on their own after they have, quote, become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ? Do we really rejoice? Do we really want to see that? Hmm. Perhaps not. We pastors generally do not like seeing our, quote, members, unquote, leave our church. Now, we will analyze this term, members, later, at a later session. God forbid our mature members leave and start their own church to compete with us and steal our sheep. God forbid. I heard from a pastor, a former pastor in a megachurch in my city, that when he was first hired to be a pastor in that megachurch, he had to sign a contract in which he agreed that if and when he left that church, he would never start another church like his own church within a radius of something like 50 miles of the megachurch, which had hired him. He had to sign such a contract. Hmm. Sounds like business to me. So how do we keep our members from leaving our flock? Now, one unspoken and often unintended way of keeping members from leaving our church is to keep them from, quote, becoming mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. In that way, they stay, they stay dependent on us, and they remain. Hopefully, this is done unconsciously and not deliberately by us pastors and servants of God. But we were told the following from a pastor's wife in a church in Germany where we taught the Elijah Challenge. Now, in the Elijah Challenge, of course, we teach God's people, we teach disciples how to heal the sick and cast out demons exactly as Jesus did for the purpose of providing irrefutable evidence to unbelievers, to the world, that Jesus Christ is indeed the only way to the one true God who created the universe. That is what we teach in the Elijah Challenge. Now, after 
this pastor's wife heard the teaching, then she came to us and she was concerned. She said, this is not so good because if you teach our members to do this, then they no longer need to depend on us to minister to the sick and cast out demons. And that's not good. Some of us pastors might think that same way unconsciously for the sake of our, quote, job security, unquote. Since we earn our livelihood as paid professionals who must keep the offerings coming in every Sunday so that we can pay the bills and put food on the table to feed our dear family. Humanly speaking, of course, it is quite understandable, humanly speaking. But what about Matthew 6, verse 33, where Jesus promised, seek first his kingdom, seek first his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Jesus commands us to first seek his kingdom in our personal lives. Jesus Christ is to be our king. We obey his commands. And we are to expand his kingdom in this life on earth by proclaiming the kingdom of God. We are first to seek his righteousness. We are to seek to be righteous as he is righteous. If we do that, if we seek first his kingdom and his righteousness in our lives and in the world, then Jesus promises all these things will be given to you as well. All of our personal needs will be provided for us. What about that? What about that promise? But due to the Nicolaitan structure of the church, we pastors unconsciously keep our members as spiritual children or at most adolescents. And thus we keep them dependent upon us so that they do not leave our nest to start their own fruitful ministries so that we can keep quote, paying the bills, unquote, and therefore, quote, stay in business, unquote. Now, if they start their own ministry, who knows if they might steal our sheep? The Lord forbid. Interestingly, that is why I am called teacher and not pastor. If I am called pastor, it means I have a church. And that means I can potentially steal sheep from another church to attend my church instead. And other pastors will therefore feel threatened if I am called pastor. And so I am called teacher. Uh, let me tell you, I do not now pastor a church. But nevertheless, it's quite sad. This matter reflects the sad state of the church as a result of the teaching of the Nicolaitans, which Jesus hates. Now we can begin to understand why Jesus hates it. In the early church of the book of Acts, the problem of churches stealing sheep from one another did not exist. The teaching of the Nicolaitans was still in its infancy. Question. Don't we expect our own biological children to leave our nest after they grow up and hopefully become more successful than us? Shouldn't this be the hope of a pastor who is after the Lord's heart? But the Nicolaitan structure of the church forces us pastors to think and to hope otherwise. With the Nicolaitan structure of the church now, where believers are fed only once or twice a week, few believers can attain to our professional status as pastors by doing what is necessary to gain ecclesiastical titles like Reverend. Reverend, of course, means worthy of reverence. But only Jesus is worthy of reverence. The great majority of believers will not reach mature adulthood in Christ. They will not. 
and they will not be equipped for fruitful ministry. Instead, they are taught to expect us professionals, professional pastors, to babysit them and take care of their many needs, since that is what we pastors are paid to do. We babysitters, thus we relieve God's people of the responsibility of studying God's word for themselves. Look what Paul told Timothy, his disciple, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. This applies to every believer. But due to the current Nicolaitan structure of the church, which has reduced the church to mostly a human organization with members and membership, we pastors end up feeding God's word to his people only once or twice a week during scheduled events. Now, how often do you feed your children at home? Just once or twice a week? Of course not. Many of us feed our children three times a day. How can God's children possibly grow to maturity in Christ, being fed only once or twice a week in church? And when we do feed God's people in church, it is often teaching them how to overcome the many trials and challenges in life. And this, of course, would appear to be very much needed. We do face many challenges. But what if instead we teach them to focus on obeying the Lord's commands despite their difficult circumstances? Again, the Lord's magnificent promise in Matthew 6, 33 comes into play. So do not worry, saying, what shall we eat? Or what shall we drink? Or what shall we wear? Or what should I do about the situation in the office? So what should I do? Verse 32, for the pagans run after all these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them. Verse 33, but seek first his kingdom, seek first his righteousness, and all these things will be given to you as well. Seek first his kingdom in your personal life. Make Jesus Christ your king, obey his commands. For seek his kingdom in the world by preaching the gospel and fulfilling the Great Commission. Seek first to be righteous as he is righteous. And all these things will be given to you as well. My wife and I have personally witnessed this wondrous promise fulfilled in our lives over and over and over and over. The Lord has taken care of us and our family so, so very well as we seek first to expand his kingdom, as we seek first to be righteous as he is righteous. The Lord is faithful. But under the Nicolaitan system, God's people cannot, quote, mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. No, they cannot. And so they will remain in our church as members, and they will serve under our authority as lay people. To repeat, very few of us pastors deliberately keep our people from maturing, although a few might, actually. Rather, this is an unwitting course of action predetermined by the Nicolaitan system which Jesus hates. It has resulted in the traditional structure of 